Hey everyone, welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. We're doing a series of special interviews this week from Porkfest in New Hampshire. This is a project of the Free State Project and it's a gathering of libertarians and constitutional conservatives, Republicans, uh, we even had some uh, converted progressives here who are looking for liberty and we're hanging out in this beautiful place and these conversations are gonna be awesome, check it out. We'll just uh, like, if we have to, we can just bleep out large sections of the of the conversation because okay. you're, you're still on your first cup of coffee. That is true. Now I'm I'm worse after a few cups of coffee. I'm, okay. I'm chill in the morning, and then once I get them in me, I'm like, God, I'm fucking fed. So right. so sweet spot right now. Right now, perfect. All right. So uh, uh, good set last night. How does it feel to do an audience that you know is going to love you no matter? how shitty you might be that night. <laughs> Wait, you started with good set, and then I felt like the implication of there was like, <laughs> man, they loved you, and you were terrible. And they were still, well, I, it's a very- uh, No, it, it, was, it was a fantastic well, set. Well, thank you very much. And there was just a ton of energy, and I love, I love that sense of, of belonging that I think everyone there had. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a weird thing, because like, so I've been doing stand-up for about almost 15 years. And I've had a, like a following, you know, uh, of anything for for maybe two or three years. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been growing. But before that, it was I. Whenever I was doing stand up, it was always just a, a random group of people. And it's kind of a whole different challenge to just make some random group of people laugh. Who kind of start with this, like, who's this guy? You know, is he funny? Um, but then when you're performing for your audience, like the people who know you, it's a whole different energy. And specifically with the libertarian crowd, I can just do stuff for them. Like, I don't have to work as much to set things up because they already kind of know what I'm talking about. So it's really fun and just relaxing. Yeah, last night was great, man. That was a really fun show. Yeah, it, and it, I bet you the audience itself sort of changes the, the set. And sure. the performance, right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, it's stand up is like a relationship. You know, it's like you're even though you're the one talking and the audience generally isn't, they're talking after every joke with how they feel about that joke. You know, like they're letting you know. Instantly as soon as you tell the joke, they're like, Well, here's your report card. Yeah. That got medium laughter. You know, and then like you tell another joke and they're like, That one was an A. You get an A plus on that. So it's this dialogue and so the audience has a huge role in, in how you're going to be able to to tell jokes. So what do you do when your best joke is greeted with silence? Ooh. Has that ever happened? A little party of dies inside. Oh, yeah. That's hap – oh, yeah. I mean, I've – like I said, I've been doing it for like 15 years. When you start out, you do these awful shows. And I've done shows for like four drunk people in New York City, and I'm like the 13th comic. Yeah. And they're just they're, – but it's, it's, it's a great experience. Stand-up comedy is a, – is a, especially the early years, it's like, it's like fighting. Like uh, guys who do jiu-jitsu talk about this a lot. It's the ultimate humbling thing. Like when you first start, no matter – the best MMA guy you've ever seen, the first time he went into his jiu-jitsu gym, he was rolling with brown belts and just getting embarrassed, you know? Yeah. Like, he had to come from that. And every comic is like that, too. Everyone in their first few years went through bombs. There's nothing worse than bombing when you're an amateur and you're not prepared to bomb. Like, you don't even know how to do it gracefully. And it's, oof, it's wonderful to watch. If you ever get the chance to watch a real bomb, like a stand-up com uh, comic doing a show, and there is not one laugh in the crowd, and he just has to go like, and then, uh, huh. and you get nothing, and then he's like, so anyway, um, and just what? I mean, it's horrible, but it's amazing to see. It's got like, I was talking to Tom Woods about this yesterday. I don't think we did it during the show, but um, he was, he did theater and and has some, some training um, embarrassing himself in front of a bunch of people. Is that true? Tom did theater? Isn't that right? Someone help me out I didn't know here. that. Yeah. Yeah, did you, so you didn't even know this. I did not know. I, I was a close friend. Yeah. I never knew he was such a dork. <laughs> oh, come on. Libertarians, dorks. There is there is a Venn diagram that overlaps <laughs> somehow. But I what? thought he was just a cool, badass historian. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out he's doing theater. And, like, well, I, I think there's a relationship. Uh, we, we have this new generation of libertarians that can actually communicate ideas to an audience and when I was a kid, I'm older than everybody here, and when I was a kid, the entire libertarian movement, we would carry around copies of Man, Economy, and State, 
and and quote the footnotes to each other and that that was our idea of communication <laughs> and and we've grown up since then but uh, one of the things that that Tom was talking about and it sounds like there's a similar story with you um, the grind of becoming a comedian gets you past um, the fear of talking in front of people and you you sort of have to and maybe you never had that fear well no I mean I think I'm sure I did. I mean, I was always kind of a natural like uh, performer. Like I like to talk, and I always like even when I was a little kid, I liked to talk in front of a group of people. Um, but no, it was uh, there were a lot of nerves to performing, uh, particularly performing stand up. And yeah, it's it, it's just like anything else. It's like the the more you throw yourself into that, the the less anxiety and all that stuff you're gonna have. Because in the, in the same sense that like I, I look at it. Like if somebody, if you've never been in a fist fight in your life and someone just rushes you and attacks you and starts throwing punches at you, you're going to be nervous. There's no like, you're gonna be scared. There's no human being who won't be. Something's broken in you if you're not, you know? But if you ran up on like a Golden Gloves boxer and started throwing punches at him, he's probably not gonna be so scared. He's going to be like, oh, I'm going to knock this guy out because he's had punches thrown at him over and over and knows how to deal with them, knows how to throw back. Like it's just so it's just the experience and the competence makes it much less anxiety provoking to, to do yeah. something. So that's it. It's just like anything else. Like you just got to practice it and get more comfortable and better at it. It's kind of like and I was I was a super scared speaker when I was in graduate school. Like I, I would just freeze on stage and it it pissed me off so much I started forcing myself to embarrass myself yeah and like I s grossly simplistic you know that the way that you get to be a decent communicator is first of all you have to like embarrass yourself so that the fear doesn't matter anymore yeah and then you're comfortable on stage and then you actually have to know something about what you're talking about that helps <laughs> not always if you're a politician <laughs> but then you then you get to get, watch like the really good guys um, like I I had a chance to sort of watch Glenn Beck, who is an amazing public communicator. And then once you get past those two things, you can sort of work on technique. Yeah. And, you know, technique matters. But, you know, I, I think about this in, in the context of the modern liberty movement. Not everybody needs to be a public speaker, but we, we need lots of good communicators. And I don't think I'm not the person that's that's interested in telling people what to communicate. That's up to them. But. But if 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 we're going to grow as a movement, we got to do some of the stuff that you're doing. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I think, and I I think that I I'm really kind of blown away by how many people like young libertarians who are really charming, charismatic people, not the caricature of us that that some have, where these uh, like incredibly socially awkward people. Don't get me wrong, we got plenty of those too. Um, but they they play their role. As I mean, well, present you know? company accepted. Yes, yes, for sure. Right. But I'm I'm blown away by how many good young communicators there are, and that that makes me very optimistic. Because I agree with you that that's if we're gonna have a movement, then you have to have something that people are attracted to, and we should like you know even when you said like the politicians who don't maybe don't know what they're talking about or maybe are just kind of lying, but they do know at least some of them, the good ones. The effective ones know how to be attractive to people to say something that's going to be a, a message that resonates with those people and we should learn from all of them yeah. like, even if they're the bad guys we should learn from them i mean imagine we had somebody who could give a speech as good as barack obama can you know imagine we had somebody who could who could rally the undying love and support that trump has for him now, they're both bad guys you know then they were bad presidents but there's something there that we could learn from. It's like, you know, okay. Yeah. And, and before we started, we were talking about, about populism. And, and it, this kind of gets into what I want to talk about. There's, from my perspective, populism is typically used for evil, but in and of itself, like politics, like political parties, it's an empty slate. Right. And if I want to be a libertarian populist, which is how I describe myself, all I'm saying is I want to take the ideas that we all cherish and translate them into a story that's actually compelling to people that never read human action and certainly didn't sort through the, the, the footnotes. 
Um, and to me, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's almost a requirement if we want our movement to be popular. And, and if we're not trying to at least engage people that aren't like us, um, I, I'm not sure what the point is of what we're doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just don't see how – obviously, there are, there are problems with, with modern populism, modern populism and with all previous forms of populism – and you could look at a left-wing populist or a right-wing populist, and I'm sure find a whole list of areas that we would disagree with them on. But to me, from the libertarian perspective, I mean, we have, you know, in the United States of America, we're, we're living under the largest government in the history of the world by any reasonable metric. Spends more money, has more weapons, big, biggest spying capacity, biggest prison in the state, like everything you could think of. And... We have a completely managed economy, and this is this has led to like this whole you know the whole cartelization of the economy, where you have you know the the kind of Federal Reserve member banks that lead to this Wall Street casino where so much of the money is made. Then you know you ever see on the on the maps where um like the richest counties in America are, and they're like basically all outside Washington D.C. or outside New York City. Now that's not capitalism. It's not like there's some great industry there that's produced, oh, there's so many factories or something. This is just that, well, this is where the easy money goes into the stock market game, and this is where the politically connected get their government funds over here. So a populist who's just furious at the elites, I mean, how could any libertarian not at least understand why? Like, understand why, yeah, this is a really unfair system that is really unfair to regular people. And so to me, I think our job as libertarians is to kind of take that energy and say, yeah, you have every right. You know, you really are being screwed over. Okay. But here's how you're being screwed over. And here's what would actually solve the problem. You know, like, I, it's like a, a lot of people on the populist left and the populist right have really correctly identified problems. They just oftentimes have the wrong solutions. I mean, even the, the populist left wingers, they're not wrong about the whole health care problem. It's insane. I mean, you guys get health insurance, it's so expensive. It's like ridiculous. I, I I pay like thirty grand a year for my family to have, just in premiums, and then if I go to the doctor, I still got to pay more. And there's people out there who just this just ruins them, you know. And so I understand the the impulse to be like, okay, but but here's the problem. Your answer is what the the government just socializes the healthcare system when the whole problem is that the government has driven all the prices up to begin with. So. Left or right, I'm, I'm open to talk to populists, and I agree. I think the only way we'd ever have a successful libertarian movement is if it is a, with a spirit of populism. It's like a spirit of, like, these guys are screwing you over, and it's not right. Yeah. And here's, here's the solution. So uh, Naomi Wolf is here at Porkfest. Oh, is she? Yeah. I, I didn't see her. She's, uh, she, is she speaking today, maybe? Does anyone know? But, uh, you know, I've uh, – and I've – done stuff with Tulsi Gabbard and and I saw you know Justin Amash got beat up pretty bad for working with uh, AOC on something I don't remember what it was but I've, I've always thought that um, you know working with Republicans when they're onto something and and Tom Woods and I talked a lot about uh, Ron DeSantis mm -hmm. whatever you think about Ron DeSantis he's a hero on one subject that matters a lot um, and whatever you think about Naomi Wolf, I don't know that much about her, but on some subjects that matter a lot to me, she's she's pretty heroic as well. So I'm I'm thinking that there's a way to be a real libertarian, TM, <laughs> and still work with uh, people where you just might have one important issue in common. Like that to me is what when you get to the populism stuff. We're going to have to work with all sorts of people who are never going to be like us. Yeah, 100. I, I completely agree with that. I, I publicly defended Justin Amash for, for having AOC like speak to his students or whatever. I thought it was crazy people were criticizing him for that. I mean, look, there are issues that we would probably agree with AOC on. I mean, okay, not that many, and she's really, really bad on a lot of other ones, but we got to be able to coalition on issues that, that she gets right. And, and Tulsi Gabbard, I mean, come on. Like, if you're, if you're anti-war, she was the lone voice in the, Democrat, in the Democratic field who was like, hey, that's the priority to me. And she was far from perfect on a whole list of issues. But you know, let me say, with the DeSantis one particularly, I think there's a real risk for libertarians who don't give him his credit. 
Um, and I, I've seen a lot of people like like libertarians on Twitter and stuff, and I'll be like, oh, DeSantis, yeah, he's but he's an authoritarian too. He's a statist also, and and it it's almost like revealing of your worldview. Like, look, we we can love this libertarian philosophy, and I do. I love it as much as anyone. But the philosophy is is not the main thing. The main thing is real freedom in real people's lives. That's what you really care about. The philosophy is only useful to the extent that it could actually get real freedom in real people's lives. And for you to just, look, quit. DeSantis, in the biggest test of his life, passed with flying colors. In a, in a situation where everybody else robbed all basic liberties from their people, this one governor stood up against the world. Like every nation, every advanced nation was doing these lockdowns. And he could have easily just done them. There would have been no pressure on him for that as everyone else was doing it too, you know? But he didn't, or maybe he did for two weeks, but then he didn't. And he gave his people more real tangible liberty than almost anybody else uh, in the free world, maybe outside of Sweden or something like that. And if we're just gonna ignore that, like that doesn't matter, then you're revealing of yourself like, oh, you don't really care about real liberty in real people's lives. You care about your little philosophy and being, I get a 100% A-plus score on my ANCAP test or whatever. And that's like, so you could still criticize him for other things. He's bad on a lot of other issues. But to not at least give him his credit for that, I think is a real, it's a risk to our movement. So I was, I did a clubhouse with uh, Ron Paul maybe six weeks ago or something, and it was it was a predictably a massive room because that's what happens when Ron Paul yeah. shows up. But he said something that um, I guess I knew, but I'd never heard him say it, and it, it was really profound to me that he would he would go give his speech, and you guys have all heard of Ron Paul's speech, and and he's he's flaming the state and raging against the machine, and afterwards young people would come up and say, "Thanks for giving me hope." And, and he was as surprised as anybody. He's like, I don't, I just told you that the world is going to hell in a handbasket yeah. and I'm giving you hope. And, and I think she understood, the person that said that to him understood better than he did exactly what he was doing because he wasn't just raging against the machine. He was, he was laying out this, this beautiful vision based on cooperation yeah. and the things we could do together. And, and that's sort of the, the crux of what I want to talk about today. What is the balance? I mean, the populist side is just being pissed off at what the war machine is doing and what mass incarceration and crony capitalism. And every single libertarian's great at railing against that stuff. Yeah. Um, but we're not so good at the beautiful part because I feel like once you get people fired up about what's wrong with the system and how it's crushing um, human opportunity, you have to say, well, we do have a way to solve these problems. So what's the balance? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I struggle with that sometimes myself, and, and Ron Paul is really just the best example of that. He was always just the happy warrior, and always just had that, and he didn't even really care. It was like, you could boo Ron Paul out of an maybe arena. It's just, maybe it's a and, tone, right? Yeah, well, it, yeah, possibly. I mean, I do think like, focusing on being against the evil to me is like the most important thing like if you're an abolitionist during slavery you know it's like you have to focus on what the evil is that you're trying to get rid of but there it is important to stress like the the beauty in our philosophy of peace and cooperation and prosperity and civilization so i i i agree i think there's there's something to that i don't know that i have the perfect have found the perfect balance on that but I would say to the Ron Paul thing, I think that Ron Paul t tapped into something um, that is bigger than than libertarianism, um, and and bigger than than any anything in our anything in a free market or anti-war or anything like that. I think what he tapped into was a lot of what Jordan Peterson uh, tapped into, uh, and, and why so many young people responded the way they did. And it has to do with the fact that we really. Like, I, I'm, an, I'm like a 90s kid, you know, I, I grew up in the 90s, and I was born in 83, so like 80s, 90s kid. Um, and we really grew up in a very nihilistic time. I mean, it's like there was no, kids my age, you know, didn't grow up with like a, any type of like purpose handed to you. It wasn't like, you know, like in the past where there were these traditions and religions, or there was no like God, country, chivalry, you know, like none of this was embedded in us. 
It was just kind of like, I don't know, what's the purpose of life? Like, I don't know, get your homework done so you can play video games afterward. Like, have some fun, you know? And that's kind of how a lot of young men, particularly in our society, just enter into the world. Like, it's just like, I don't know, I guess I want to get, like, go to college because everyone's going to college and then maybe get as good a job as I could get so I have a good job. Maybe get, get drunk, get laid, like, whatever. You know, this is just kind of life. And then you had these, like, these men who were coming in and offering you, like, a greater purpose to all of this. Like, there is something bigger than you that you can be a part of, that you can strive for. And even that, just the, offering you that journey, even if you may not be victorious, is offering you, like, a whole different life but with meaning. And, and like, it, it's there's something about that that I think almost every society ever in human history offered young men some type of purpose even if it's completely misguided you know they offer him something and we just had a complete absence of that and people were really searching for something yeah i mean it, that that's an interesting take on the 1990s because i i have this theory that that we're in the middle of a paradigm shift that that all of these old institutions you know god country um the nightly news that used to tell you what to think um schools uh, uh authority figures in your life all of those top-down structures were, were really sort of destroyed by technology. Yeah. And, it, and it, it broke up all of these old institutions that sort of held everything together and, and sort of in a Hayekian way that the institutional constraints on individual choice and all that stuff. And, you know, how we deal with a radically democratized world is what we're going through right now. And I agree with you. I went to one of Jordan Peterson's rock concerts, and I call it that mm -hmm. because... He played in Philadelphia, the same place that a young Springsteen pa played. Right, right. And I'm like, how the fuck does a professor fill a room with all those people? And like, he's not even, he's an incredibly smart speaker, but he's not a performer at all. Right, no, not at all, yeah. Like he forgets to let people clap. Yeah. And he just keeps charging on, but man, there was electricity in that room. And I'm like, it has to be ideas and it has to be this core notion. And, and by the way, there's all sorts of things I disagree with Jordan Peterson on, but this core thing about get yourself straight first. Yeah. And here's how you do it. Like that's there there is a very libertarian version of that. You know, that feeling you get when you look in the mirror and say no one's going to do this for me. I got to do it. Like that's our thing. Yeah. And personalizing it and and turning it into kind of a I hate the word self-help, but like the responsibility paradigm. Yeah, and it's not I mean it was real it was the best of self help uh, self help like it was real you know psychological advice and and there was something i think uh, like i always felt like there was something that jordan peterson hit into on that that is the half of the message that's missing in the libertarian world like he you know rights and responsibilities are two sides of the same coin right, right. like liberty and then accountability like that's it it's like yeah you you're you're free but then you have to take responsibility for your life and the what we live in today right is especially for young people we have you know the most wealth and resources of any society basically that's ever existed um, you know, we, we just don't spend enough time appreciating that. Um, you live like an infinitely more comfortable life than your your grandparents. And in you can't even imagine than your great, great, great grandparents. Like it's just it would be inconceivable to them to have the luxuries we have. And so you have all of these wealth, the wealth and the resources and everyone's talking about rights all the time and freedoms. Now, this is, the idea has been completely perverted by the left where it's like, you know, anything that they think you should have is called a right, you know, the right to health care, education, or whatever, like everything, you know, all, all they talk about are rights, you know, gay rights, trans rights, black rights, women's rights, like it's, it's rights, 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 rights. You're, now, so that's been so muddied that it's just like, whatever you want is rights. But no one ever talks about the flip side of it. No one ever talk, talks to you about taking on the responsibility. And that's the whole other half of this thing that we could sell. And Jordan Peterson weirdly found out that you can really sell responsibility. Because that is the beauty. That is the beauty of being an adult. Like that's the fun of it. That's the fun of having a family or having a business or having a, a job. It's like, yeah, okay, you have responsibilities now. That's where you get your kind of like self-esteem from. That I meet my responsibilities. So there's something powerful there, you know. And he really harnessed it. Yeah, then, and, and I, I think um, in a very different way, and ultimately false way, AOC does the same thing because she is talking a lot about dignity, right? Economic dignity, human dignity. And and the, the lie there 
is that she thinks that a politician or a government program or an empty promise from a politician somehow can convey dignity. So you're, you're sort of outsourcing the responsibility to find meaning in your life. And, and it's, a, it's a horrible thing, but the part that, that I think resonates with young people is they're, they're looking for dignity and they're, they're trying to figure out, you know, you described yourself as a 90s kid. I think, I think young people today are trying to find meaning in their lives specifically because they have everything they need, right? They're not yeah. thinking about how they get dinner that night. You know, mom's not wondering if her children are going to be fed. So you, you're, you're, you're a little bit fat and happy, Yeah. but you still need to have a purpose in life. And it used to be to go hunt and kill something so that you wouldn't die. Yeah. So right. what, what is it now? Well, that's it. I mean, that's the question. I don't know that I have the answer to that, but that's it, right? That we were hardwired to always have the purpose so clearly right in front of us. And now it's so much more abstract and like, I don't know, what do you want to fit? But I think there are these kind of um, traditional uh, outlets for for these things that if you, you know, at least the, the really basic building ones like family and love and community and all of these things that I think have really been destroyed by the state. And by the, the fact that we live uh, under such a large government has completely just it's destroyed all of the community bonds of, you know, uh, um, churches, communities, families, all these things, because the state crowds them out and would rather be the one that people are dependent on. So you take away those community structures and you take away the kind of direct purpose that's right in front of you of we're going to survive through the winter is like our goal. And and you you get nihilism. Yeah. And uh, one, one of my friends, Lee Schooland, uh, she grew up uh, during the Cultural Revolution in China, and she talks a lot about that process of, of stripping responsibility from people. And, and you're left with sort of this hollow shell that then becomes you know, one, of the, one of the automatons that's marching in, in, the, in the communist mm -hmm. army. They, they, they destroy culture first. Right. And they destroy your individual identity and and your your purpose in life, and replace it with the state. and And I see that happening in our country. Obviously, we're we're very wealthy. We're we're not communist China, but I see this process of of stripping us of that responsibility and identity that we have in ourselves. Yeah, and not just like in stripping, but like there's an all out attack on it. Like if you that that is that is like considered evil by the establishment to have any type of like pride in any tradition that you might be a part of and and that, I think that's a very dangerous game and it's it's funny because even as you're saying it it's like what was it it was the marxist critique of capitalism right was that it like atomizes yeah. the, the individual but really what you look at the, the it's it's really all the state i think it was um uh, hans hermann hoppe who said that if you look at marx's class analysis and just applied it to the state it's almost completely accurate. Like if you just took it, instead of like the bourgeois values, you just applied this to like the state, he kind of has a really good point. And there's, there's a real irony yeah. in that. So I had this, uh, and, and, I, and you did as well, but I had this, this visceral reaction against the authoritarianism of, of lockdowns and the government's response to COVID. And, and I feel like you've spoken about this before perhaps. A, a little bit, yeah. But like early on, before we knew what was happening, we didn't know how dangerous this virus was, but, but you could see that, that stripping of responsibility and, and, and sort of the denial that, that humans um, naturally have a process for figuring out really complex, uncertain problems, and it's called localism. It's, you know, Hayek describes it perfectly when he talks about, about how knowledge of time and place and, and our personal aspirations all come together to create um, something so much bigger than any one of us could have done. And that was all replaced with Andrew Cuomo saying, I'm gonna herd old sick people into nursing homes, which should have hopefully been an obviously bad idea, but, but we just said, we need, we need leaders. We need really smart people. And, and um, first of all, there isn't anybody that smart, but second of all, we, we chose poorly. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. But like, that's, I see that, that process of, of stripping us of our our responsibility and our our ability to to, to figure stuff out, 
um, it was a big opportunity for the, for the statists. Yeah, and it was a real, um, it, COVID was like a major stress test for America, and we failed on, on every level. Tragically. And, yes, uh, yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot, of peop- a lot of libertarians failed on it as well, which really is kind of eye-opening. Um, the idea to me that, and, and I agree with all of what you're saying, like there's, the, there's like calculation problems and there's knowledge problems with the central planning and stuff like that. But to me, what really like was, was creepy was just that so quickly, with, with such a small fear campaign, You know, you think about the first two weeks of March. It was like going into March, COVID was no big deal. And and then two weeks in, it was like, okay, they've got and and they scared people enough with this minimum minimal campaign to get Americans to say, I will give up every semblance of of freedom. And I don't even mean freedom in the way we conceive of it, like this libertarian. I just mean freedom the way a normal American goes, well, yeah, it's a free country. You You're know? allowed to go to a restaurant. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm allowed. the government can't tell me not to go to church, like obviously, you know. Yeah. They gave all of that up, all of it. No, and, and no pretense of there is a Bill of Rights, there is a Constitution, we are a free society. Not, the, a lot of people were very happy to give that up. And to see like that right-wingers would allow the government to close their churches. You're like, wow, okay, so that's that's... That's really something like that. It, it was a it was a it was revealing about how what level of toughness and what level of fight we really have in this country. I used to always say for years, I'd be like the right wingers would never let the government take their guns. They just would never let them do it. And after 2020, I'm like, I don't know. I got to I got to reevaluate that. Maybe they would. Maybe for the right excuse, the right guy doing it, they would just let him take all their guns. I, I mean, I don't know. I hope I'm wrong about that. But it's a it, it was really something to watch so many people just fold, give it all up. Every, like, I will agree, okay, this, this, uh, this virus is a threat, therefore totalitarianism. That is not a threat anymore. Totalitarianism, like straight up, to, you know, I will, I will wake up and listen to my governor on TV every day to find out what I'm allowed to do today. Oh, I can see my grandma. Oh, oh, can't go to my dad's funeral. Like, just whatever your governor dictates to you. That's, unbelievable and the fact that any libertarian was not railing against that like what so then what are you really like then we're not we're not really the same thing me and you i mean you could claim i i believe in liberty in the abstract but then when the real test comes like totalitarianism comes to america and you, and you're not against that then then in, what is your what is this view in your head that i believe in liberty what is that actually worth like i'm better i'm more on the same side as a right winger who was anti lockdowns than I am on a libertarian who supported them. That 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 person is believes more in freedom than you do. Yeah, it it like one of one of my favorite rants as an old libertarian. Um, it seems like the professional libertarian class has never been there when it matters. Like most of the time, the stuff we do doesn't matter that much at the margin. We're a slow process of sort of educating and building, but. You know, uh, my first experience was the invasion of Kuwait. I found myself uh, protesting in Washington, D.C. with like three leftist hippies and tie dyes because <laughs> I couldn't find any libertarians that wanted to join me. And of course, 9 11, everybody took a dive, the Wall Street bailouts. You go back and look at the professionals when it mattered during the Wall Street bailout to see who stepped up. And I, I wrote a piece for Reason at the time uh, called What Would Mises Do? And my joke, which was not a joke, is we could fit the entire movement in a, in a VW bus. <laughs> and so there is a, there's a pattern where we flake, right? Yeah. And it, it comes back to fear, I think. Yes. Fear is the weapon that government has against us. And sort of back to the Ron Paul thing, you know, can hope trump fear? And right now we're failing that test. Yeah. Well, it, well, it better or we're, or we're all screwed. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's like there's your marching orders, uh, but that's but that's it. Right. Like, what do you do? Like, um, I don't know if like if there's 20 armed men coming to kill you and your family in your home and you have a gun and you're like, I don't know if this one gun is enough to kill all these people. And it's like, well, it better be <laughs> or else you and your family are dead. So yeah. we don't really have another option. But just to, tr- you know, try our best to, to make it the case that hope, you know, can, can prevail. 
But a lot of this stuff too, right? Like the game in America, it's not really, it's not like there, there is this naked authoritarianism, statism, right? Like there is the cop who will arrest you for being maskless, like in a park or something. There's that. But what really moves the whole system, and I think this is the, the case in like even in North Korea or in China or anything like that, what really moves the whole system is the, like people being ostracized, people being ridiculed, being afraid of being called every bad name in the book. Like that's what really controls the vast majority of people. That's why so many people were afraid to speak out against the lockdowns. That's why so many people are afraid in the moment of the banker bailouts to speak out against them. Then years later, like now you see a lot of people, you know, now you see Jon Stewart making lab leak jokes. It's okay now. Right. But like who was willing to do that a year ago? That was a real test of courage. And if you were going to do that, you were going to get called every name in the book. So I, my thing is that I think that libertarians need to develop a, a thick skin against that. And, and we have to find a way to just laugh off every one of these accusations. Because if you're ever effective and you're ever a threat to the establishment power, you will get called every name. You will, no matter how good you are. Bernie Sanders, when it looked like he was going to win the Democratic primary, all of a sudden he was a sexist. His supporters were Nazis. Like, this isn't me. This is literally what the corporate press all decided in a week when he looked like a threat. Oh, it turns out Bernie Sanders hates women. I know he's been here for 75 years and we've never said this once. But now that he's going to be the Democratic candidate, it turns out he hates women and his supporters are Nazis. I know he's a Jew. Don't let that mess with you. They're Nazis who are coming to take over, you know, the country. So that's it. That's what we're going to get called. So find a way, find a way to deal with that because there's too many libertarians who are afraid of that. Like we can't we can't say the thing the corporate press has decided we're really not allowed to say. Yeah. And that's a bad path. You know, my, um, and maybe I'm just being hopeful, but when John Brennan decides to throw end libertarians onto this rogues list of, of monsters and enemies of, of America, they're afraid of something. Like, why is he going after us? We, we, don't, we don't have anything. And I think it's because they know that we're the only guys that have that alternative vision that could draw people away from this, this one-size-fits-all, do-what-you're-told kind of mentality. And I'll go back to the Wall Street bailout. Like um, we actually, at, so we live in Washington D.C. and, and we threw um, an end of Liberty Party at my house, and everybody that was in that VW bus came over to the house. And there was a dark time in 2008 where I was just like, everything I've worked for my entire life is over because we're just completely fucked now. And of course, out of that emerged a spontaneous uprising. That, that very much precedes Barack Obama. It became the Tea Party movement, but you know Ron Paul was already um, working those fields before that. And because of technology, there was this massive grassroots uprising against the Wall Street bailouts. The first one died, and then they had to go through the Fed because, be, right. because America wouldn't put up with it. So, so moving forward, and you see it in the UK, one of the reasons I'm so despondent today is like um, uh, activists in the UK and you know, showing up in the streets in, in, in London is a lot more dangerous than showing up in the streets in America. But you know, they killed backsports, as far as I can tell, just by showing up. And you're seeing this all over the world where people are showing up. I don't see it so much in the United States, but there, there's always an opportunity for a counter-revolution, and that has to be our moment. Yeah, yeah. You gotta kind of like learn the the lessons of how everybody acts, you know? This is like why boxers watch tape of other boxers and why they throw a lot of feints, right? Because they wanna see how this guy moves and then they wanna draw you into a position where you're more vulnerable. And to me, like the other example on, on that list there that always stuck out, stuck out to me is when Obama basically declared war on Syria yeah. and said, we're going to Syria and we're overthrowing Assad. And the American people, and particularly the, the active duty military community, was like, no, we are not. There was this massive campaign, and he backed down. Now, much like with the Fed banker bailouts, then they went in and armed the rebels and did all this other stuff. You know, so like they did it in their own way, but there's something interesting to learn that the people did have the power to shut it down. And you think about, like, if you think about the Iraq war, they didn't, it's not like 9-11 happened and then we went into the war in Iraq. They spent a year 
with this massive propaganda campaign from every outlet of the corporate press. It was not the New York Times was carrying the Republican president's water, Judy Miller and all those people. They were just completely he's got weapons of mass destruction. We probably think he was in bed with Al Qaeda. I, he might be working with Iran. Like there were the most ridiculous ideas ever, like that Saddam Hussein and the Iranians, that, such good friends. Right. Like all this stuff. But they needed this propaganda campaign. And what does that tell you? It tells you that they don't think they could have done the war without that. They needed to convince people to buy into it. And that's our opening. It's like, oh, okay, so they do need to have us somewhat convinced. So if, in other words, what you can deduce from that is that if they couldn't have convinced us, they probably couldn't have had that war. Yeah. And so that's the, that's the silver lining there. Like, oh, all right, the people actually can stop some of this. Yeah. And, and by the way, that, that Syria campaign – um, I was a Tea Party leader at the time and, and, and working very closely with Thomas Massey, who was mm -hmm. kind of taking all the, the, the spears on the House floor. And, of course, he's always a backbencher. So he, in of himself, when, when he sticks his neck out, um, it's, it's not a, a zero-sum game for him. Sure. Um, but that coalition was uh, Tea Party Republicans, Tea Party activists, uh, the, the Glenn Greenwald crowd – uh, anti-war progressives, and of course, libertarians front and center. So it, it kind of goes full circle to the thing we were talking about earlier. Um, I think those coalitions are very powerful and we sort of just have to disagree, agree to disagree on all that other stuff. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. Because that was an important fight. That's That was like Ron Paul's uh, attitude about politics, which I, I still think is the best one. It's like coalition with anyone on any issue that they're good on. And and keep saying what you think about all the other issues, and that's that. Did you remember like with uh when Tulsi Gabbard when they would try to like demonize her because she went on like Tucker Carlson's show a bunch and stuff, and they'd be right. It's like you had the Tulsi Gabbard campaign, and and they'd have these articles like, why does Tulsi Gabbard appeal to right wingers? And and it's so funny because they use right wingers as like this obvious pejorative, like well there must be something wrong with her if she. But here you had this candidate who is just a Democrat on every single issue except war, which she has made her number one issue, and she is against, for the most part, the wars. She could be a little better on them, but she's, for the most part, against war. She, she's okay with the war on terrorism, but she's smart enough to know we shouldn't fight a war on behalf of terrorism. So she's like, I don't like those wars. Which, but so what is it that a right-winger likes about her? It's that she's a little bit better than the rest of them on the most important issue, which is being anti-war. But they don't want to say that. They don't want to go, wow, Tulsi Gabbard appeals to anti-war people from all over the political spectrum, because that just kind of sounds like a good thing. <laughs> so instead, they just say, right-wingers like Tulsi Gabbard. She must be a secret Nazi or something. Like, It's so strange. But yeah, we should work with all those people. Good. Like those guys, Glenn Greenwald's a hero to me. Matt Taibbi is a hero. I think um, uh, Aaron Maté, th some of those guys, they showed real courage and real journalism over the last few years where they get just destroyed by their own side just because like basically they won't take the CIA's talking points and parrot them. That's yeah. it. Just for saying Trump's not a Russian spy. And that, <laughs> like that's the, the process of like communications and grassroots and, and going from something that can't be said to everybody agrees with you is is always that first person sticking their neck out right yep. it's it's it, it's not going to be safe and and we need people that are going to be brave enough to do that a lot of people aren't going to want to do that and i think that's why we didn't have a unified uh, voice on on covid but i want to wrap up with uh with something positive we're here at pork fest and it it actually reminds me of a Grateful Dead parking lot because <laughs> it, yes, and I say that in a as a as a loving thing, not as a as a criticism. We got one of everybody here, like, uh, and we have all these different strategies. We have agorists. We have people trying to repopulate the the Republican Party in New Hampshire. Um, there may be some people that want to take over the Libertarian Party. I've I've I think I read about that on Twitter. I've heard something. Brian Doherty had a piece on it. Yeah. I think. Um, and, and of course, ultimately, like like what we do, and 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 typically what you do, and what what Dave, uh, what uh, what Tom Woods does, is upstream of of politics altogether. Like talking to the culture, and all of these people here seem to be getting along just fine. Even though we we could probably argue 
to death about which one of those strategies is most important. Yeah, it's really something, right? Like I was talking about this at the show the other night, but it's amazing to see like, you know, you see libertarian Twitter and then you come to like an event like this and it's like, man, it's just so different. Like everybody's cool. Yeah. Everybody's cool. I haven't had one even slightly negative interaction since I've been here. I had one person who's, you know, not, nothing, just nothing but cool people, had great conversations with some really smart people. Everyone's happy to be here. And like you said, which to me is like the most beautiful thing about liberty, is that you really do have people from all over the cultural spectrum. I mean, there's like, there, there's like everything from Christians to you know, people who are like going to do acid in the woods here and they're all here together. People have their kids. Other people are going like skating and like it's like ev and everyone's here and everyone's just cool. And that's it. Like it's it's a really beautiful thing. I'm, I'm really glad I came. And that's the, the power of community is 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 very much premise on the fact that when we're looking each other in the eyes, we're human beings. Twitter's a little bit like driving in your car. And Dude. and I say shit to bad drivers in my car that it's, I would never say yes, to their face. That's a really that's a great uh, uh, analogy. And it's, there's just something about like when you get into a competition with 280 characters and you're trying to win, and you cannot win an intelligent argument in 280 characters. It doesn't matter how, whether you're right or wrong. You can't. So the only thing that's left to do is to try to like let me just like get you with two sentences. And it just brings out the worst in so many people, myself included, at times. Um, sometimes I'm pretty good on there. But, you know, it's like, uh, um, but it is, it's, it's, it's something, I think there's a big thing, which we don't have time to like get into all of it, but there was a big thing to the lockdowns and people only living through the internet yeah. for so long and having none of this, that really, it's easy. Like I, I've said this before, but you get, uh, um, you know, you could go on the internet go on a YouTube journey or something and really convince yourself like we're on the verge of a race war in this country you know you listen to like these kind of like woke leftists you know scolding white people and then you listen to like some like alt-right guy or something like that like going back at them we need to protect the white population you're like we're gonna have a race war in this country but then you like get off the computer and go to the supermarket and there's like some black guy steps in front of you and he's like oh excuse me and I'm like no you're good and then like we just keep going and you're like you know what i think everything's fine like i don't think we hate each other at all like it's just like i don't know it's just like not this isn't real life this is not this is a a, a weird you know funhouse mirror version yeah and it's like um the preventing us from gathering i think that's why yeah. pork fest was so powerful last year is um i actually went to a concert instead because i desperately needed to go see some live music sure. and they had virtually banned it anywhere. But but that process of, of gathering and hanging out with people that are very different from you, but you're passionate about that one thing. Maybe it's a band, uh, maybe it's liberty, whatever it is, that, that gathering aspect of, of being a human is, again, like that's our sweet spot. We, we're the guys that know how people can gather without hurting each other or taking their stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is that is true, and that is uh, maybe that speaks to your point before. Like that's the positive message that we got to find a way to to get out there. Let's end with that. Thank All you. Right. Give Thank it up. Thank you very much. Give Thank you guys. Oh, awesome. That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I got, uh, Thanks for squeezing us in. Of course. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people. Mm -hmm.